Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the opening of the Master Speaker Series for uh, the spring semester. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, open this event as a Dean of the School of Business of the Prague College. Um, before starting introducing our outstanding guests or master speakers from the business field, uh, I just would like to thank our industry partners and companies we work on projects and uh, um, also I would like to uh, thank our sponsors that contributed in some sense, especially during the COVID time to sponsor the um, digital campus that in some sense provide us the possibility to offer high quality teaching to all our students. Um, I just would like to mention a few uh, of the sponsors actually that are um, joined later, lately. Uh, to sponsor the digital campus. Um, the sponsors like uh, Studio Lovecchio that you can even see here, uh, Pan Panzerotto, Amaris, Ysoft, all of them, they actually contributed uh, to, um, to the sponsorship of the digital campus that to enable us to do um, and to deliver high quality classes. I would like to introduce the speakers of tonight, um, John Cromblad and uh, uh, talk a bit about him just a few minutes and then I'll let him the floor. He's going to talk about uh, project management leadership. Uh, John is a business leader with about 40 years of uh, ex working experience in the business, but also is uh, a sort of colleague, I would say. He is actually a lecturer in higher education at the university in the United States. He's speaking from the United States. Welcome, John. Um, John, um, in his career, um, held a leadership uh, roles, high level roles uh, in sales, marketing, product and business development and project management and recently retired from Whirlpool Corporation. As you probably know, Whirlpool is the largest manufacturer and marketer of major home appliances in the world. Uh, John graduated from Concordia College in Minnesota and earned an MBA at Thunderbird School of Global Management. Currently is working still, uh, didn't give up working apparently, and uh, currently is working as a contractor for Whirlpool Corporation as a project manager in IoT, the Internet of Things, and as an adjunct lecturer is also lecturing in business at the Southwestern Michigan College. Uh, John, I think in his life traveled, I think more than 40 countries or something like that, more right. than 14 countries for work in his career, lived and worked in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Shanghai. He is going to talk tonight about something very complex or kind of easy. I don't know, we will figure out from the <laughs> easy to say and complex to define. Um, which is about project management leadership. Welcome uh, on behalf of the college, and it's a great pleasure for the business school to have you here with us. Um, John, the floor, the virtual floor, sorry about that, but the virtual floor is all yours. Uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation on behalf of the college. Thank you very much. Stefano, I appreciate that uh, very nice introduction. You saved me a slide, actually. Uh, <laughs> so it's really a pleasure to be speaking with all of you tonight, students. Uh, I don't know if there's any prospective students and, and faculty. Uh, I just appreciate the invitation. Uh, and so as uh, Stefano mentioned, I'll be talking about project management and very specifically leadership of leading teams within project management. So part of the talk is going to be about uh, what it means, uh, what project management is all about uh, to help you understand the principles uh, that I'm going to talk about. Uh, you can see here a little picture of Whirlpool's corporate headquarters. Uh, and as Stefano said, I couldn't stay away. I retired for a year and uh, I'm back at it. Uh, and that's why I'm in this project management position uh, as a contractor, uh, because I really love and enjoy uh, doing this kind of work and uh, being a contractor is a little bit freeing. So some of the, that you are the start of your career, um, this has opened up another opportunity for me to, to continue the work. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to add any more to this, but you can find me on LinkedIn as well. And uh, there might be a little bit more detail on that. So um, I wanted to initially uh, share this 
information about as we kick things off about a breakthrough objective. You know, some years ago, while I was going through a leadership training program while still uh, an employee and a director at Whirlpool, I discovered that there was a value in creating and building and using breakthrough objectives. And I found that having a breakthrough objective, like you see here, is really taking a stand for something that is outside the normal business objectives of meeting an annual objective or uh, meeting incremental goals. But really, it's about uh, a life vision. And you can see here the objective or the stand that I've created here is around being a leader. And as I, I'll just read it here with you. I'm a leader who holds myself accountable to achieve extraordinary outcomes in all aspects of life and encourage others to do the same. Now, uh, what this has done for me is it challenges me every day in my life, in my personal life, in my work life, um, and it defines me as a leader. And I encourage each of you to think about doing this for yourself. The act of creating a breakthrough objective is one that even if you haven't yet achieved it, it actually starts your mind moving toward that and becoming that person that you indicate here in your breakthrough objective stand. And you're already taking one big step down the path. So my talk today, as Stefano said, is about leadership, not just leadership in general, but specifically leadership and leading projects and more specifically teams and projects. You might find yourself in a position where either you're part of a project team or an organization, or perhaps you're leading a team of people to deliver a set of objectives. And very often we're called to these roles and people are assigned to us, or we might um, actually be assigned to be a part of that team. And this team is thrown together through an organization. And often there's not a lot of definition around how these activities or projects will be accomplished. Often as well, the teams are not part of the same organizational structure. Uh, people are asked to work together as a team and deliver a result. And perhaps you have an appointed or an elected leader, but that person who's leading the team doesn't have this hierarchical role of supervising that team. So we're gonna talk about how do we manage through some of those complexities when you're leading a cross-functional team like that? And how do we achieve those goals? Uh, I've done a lot of work in projects, but only recently in my career. And so I've had to learn uh, quite a bit about project management, probably in the last 10 years of my work life. So let's first define what is project management? Uh, what is a project? And typically we might describe a project as you're given an objective, uh, you have a start, you have an end date, and you're delivering a set of objectives. In project management, um, there are people who define it differently. Once I interviewed for a role of a project director within Whirlpool and the vice president who interviewed me at the time asked me to define project management. I'm not sure what I actually said at the moment, but what I remember is what he said to me. And his definition was project management is risk management. In other words, everything you're doing as a project leader or project manager is minimizing risk, breaking down barriers to deliver those objectives. So is that it? Well, the guide to project management, the, the body of knowledge uh, talks about this. And one of the things they do talk about is people management. But again, a project manager may not actually do the work, but is leading the team that is doing the work. The, the PMBOK guide or the, the project management body of knowledge is published by the Project Management Institute. And it's the, it's the really global industry leader uh, that guides principles around project management, uh, has published this book and it's become known as the global standard for project management. The PMBOK guide defines a project manager as someone who is assigned by the organization to lead the team. And I underlined and bolded lead the team because that's what we're talking about today. That's responsible for achieving project objectives. Therefore, the project manager is the team leader. And in project management, and, I, and I'm going to talk in principles of leadership, but it helps you to understand uh, some key competencies required in project management. There are three uh, that the PMBOK guide uh, shown here uh, really talks about. First of all is 
the importance of having a technical skill of project management, the knowledge, the skills, how you deliver projects, knowing the tools and having the skills. You can actually get undergraduate degrees, master's degrees, specifically in project management. So that is a key competency if you're going to lead a project. Now, like me, you can learn those skills. And so it doesn't, you don't have to read the PMBOK guide, but I'm going to give you some of those uh, skills and, and information as well if you're put into a, a position where you might do that, uh, but it's going to be helpful for you to learn more. Secondly, uh, knowing your specific industry is a key second point, and that's the strategic, strategic and business management. Not just knowing it, but whatever your organization, your area of influence, whether it's business, it's a specific field, it might be education or even nonprofit, you have to be knowledgeable about that area and have to have the vision, the ability to be a visionary and to be forward thinking. It's not just, uh, well, I'll go do and execute, but it's important to have that strategic capability uh, as well. And finally, the subject we're really talking about is leadership, uh, is knowing how to guide, motivate, and direct teams and being practiced and skilled at what drives behavior, what motivates team members to do their best individually and to be more productive as a team, as a whole. So in defining project management as guiding, motivating, and directing, these are very different aspects of leading. First of all, in guiding, we need to provide a roadmap so that people understand where they need to go. This requires a plan, and it's up to the project leader to develop this plan. We're gonna talk about how you do that in that overall project management process. Once the plan is there, the mission is understood, the leader must keep the team focused on that vision and mission throughout the entire project. Additionally, uh, they must keep each of the team members clear in uh, what their individual contribution is to the project and keep them in their lanes of work. Now, there's opportunity for them to expand beyond that, but that's the project leader's prerogative to manage that and guide them and keep them on the path, on the lane where they should be, and helping everyone understand what is their role to contribute to keep the gears moving in this project that might have some complexity. Secondly, it's easy to lose steam when you're perhaps distracted by other work, other responsibilities. Often people that are on project teams have multiple teams they're working on, or they have uh, competing priorities or other responsibilities outside that project. And maybe those things may even seem more interesting. So it's up to the project leader to keep the team member motivated by helping them to see how they're contributing, uh, by encouraging each other and helping each other know how to help each other when needed and overall motivating them to work together toward that common goal. Thirdly, it's uh, important that direction or directing is a key activity as well. As I mentioned, often you are leading people on a project team who don't report to you directly. And providing direction can be challenging, especially if the team members don't report to you in that organization hierarchy. Now, it's often and sometimes necessary to be an assertive leader who is assertive but yet does not lead by force. And that's a fine balance oftentimes, but keeping the team focused on that goal. Occasionally, a more assertive push is needed to give specific instructions. And as a project leader, you have to have that capability to be more assertive at times. We're going to we're going to uh, we're going to briefly. Oops, I went the wrong direction. Excuse me. There we go. Uh, we're going to look at three phases of project management leadership uh, that will help break this down a little bit in the in the uh, progression of a project. First of all, uh, we need advanced preparation, uh, what to do before the project starts. Secondly, we'll talk about leading the team during a project. And finally, uh, providing for the actions for an appropriate closure of a project. So before we actually kick off the project, we can't just gather the team and figure it out. Advanced planning is required. First, the leader should make sure that the expectations are clear. First for yourself as the leader, and then as well as others on the team. So 
it's important to know what's expected of you and what's expected of the team. And you can do this by creating a fast learning curve. Find out who are the people on your team, who are the knowledgeable people, uh, who are the experts, or who in the organization knows what's needed, uh, what you need uh, to learn about the project. Uh, you need to learn who those knowledge experts are, and we can do that by asking. It's also important to find one or two people who you can trust, who will be honest with you, who will be available to you uh, as a resource to bounce off ideas and also to be a mentor. Uh, you know, when I first started in the biggest project I, I led initially was um, a bit initially seemingly overwhelming for me because I was asked to to move my me and my family to China and to lead a, a major refrigeration project. And I was going to be the overall leader for a project where we're going to manufacture a new refrigerator in a manufacturing plant uh, in a joint venture in China. And uh, I actually, I had a meeting with the, the chief technology officer of the corporation who said to me, we believe you're the right person. We really need you to do this. And multiple times I had said to him, look, you know, I don't have a degree in project management. That's not what I was trained to do. Um, you know, it's, I don't have a lot of experience in it. I've led people who lead projects. He said to me, you don't worry about that. We want your leadership, your capability, your understanding of China, and we will get you the help you need to learn the project management skills. And as it resulted, uh, what resulted in that uh, was I had a couple of people who mentored me over that time, and one in particular eventually became my supervisor and became a mentor, not only during that project, but in future projects, uh, became a close friend of mine. And so I was fortunate to have several people that coached me along the way. And it's always important to have those opportunities to find mentors and coaches that can help you be a better leader, not only in leadership, but in the, the skills and knowledge and technology that you need. Michael Watkins in his book, The First 90 Days that you see pictured here on the slide, says that all leaders only have 90 days after they start a leadership role to get to a what he calls a break-even point when your organization needs you as the leader as much as you need that job to be in that position. You know, and a lot of times we see uh, in the United States, the president of the United States says, in my first 100 days, I'm going to do these things. Well, Michael Watkins said, you only have 90 days. And I found that it's a very effective tool. Uh, this is an excellent read, by the way. You see it here. I highly recommend it for anyone going into a new position, uh, not just a project management position. And he outlines the task that you take. And something that I very much uh, support uh, that he articulates here as well is if you follow his advice, you will meet with stakeholders, with team members and their managers and potentially others uh, who may have information that are useful for the project. Um, and this is really critical that you meet with people one-on-one. -on -one. You know, when I uh, first took this project to China, I um, started doing that. And this was not the first time I used that book, by the way, in a new position. And I met with uh, a number of folks. This was a project, and I'll tell you a little bit more detail. It was called XXL. It was a large size refrigerator. So the XXL was, was the, the company code name for the project. And it was phase four because it was the fourth iteration of that. Uh, well, first of all, when I discovered that uh, it was important that I talked to stakeholders from the other phases who told me that the whole, the previous projects had not gone well, and they were not very um, enthusiastic about me starting this thing. And the fact that it was named phase four was another problem because any of you, maybe none of you know Mandarin, but if you do, you would know that the word four in Mandarin is very similar and synonymous with the word death. So I was going into a, a potential difficult situation. We immediately changed the name with help from the project team. But the point of the story is that um, understanding that there were some previous uh, assumptions about this project that I knew I had to overcome at the very beginning by having those conversations. Now, although you might not have a perfect plan in place, it's important to develop a plan, as I said, before you start. And you can do that by answering these questions. What are you trying to accomplish? What resources do you have? Do you have the 
appropriate number of resources. What's your level of authority? How much decision can you as a leader make versus needing to make decisions by others? With help from experts, you can build that plan. And in addition, I encourage you to build that together with your team members that may already be starting to form. You want to develop that initial plan and potentially even a timeline. And the key thing is just asking questions. As I mentioned in the in the subtext note there, the act of doing the timeline and the plan, putting that in front of you will build trust with your team as you start to do that with your team before the execution and implementation of the project. And uh, they will know and be able to help you, but having that initial plan is critical before you get started. Now, before you can actually start working that plan as well, you need to make sure that you have the right team in place. Often, as I said, you have people assigned to you and experts in each area that are needed on the team. When I've led more traditional projects, now I'm leading more uh, software, agile projects. We have more traditional projects. We would have a team of experts or leads in each area, such as one for marketing, one for manufacturing, engineering, et cetera. Currently, I'm leading software projects, which are a little uh, different, which we still do have experts in software development or design or application. In any case, your project, whether it's a nonprofit or a business, you may have these people assigned to you, and it's your job as a leader to assess their capabilities initially before you even get started. Again, meeting with them and understanding if they're right for your team and whether the team is, is the right fit. Also, determining what's missing and get the help that you need from your leadership. Uh, initially, uh, you wanna do that ahead of time if you possibly can. After you've, ass you've assessed your leaders, you also need to determine uh, if, your, if their supervisors are aligned with the expectations. Uh, early on, you can, you can assess as well who might have greater potential. Uh, people you can mentor as the project progresses, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the that later and how you can help create others and build others through this and not your goal, not just being delivering the project, but developing people on your team. So the final thing here, before we get into leading the project team, you have to have clear goals and objectives established before you just start working, even if you have a plan. It can be very helpful as a leader to develop a purpose statement a purpose statement for your project and your team that should be aligned with your team. You can draft one and then modify it with help from your team. This is gonna get buy-in from your team members uh, as well. In addition, you wanna list clear objectives after you have that purpose statement that are aligned with your sponsors and your stakeholders, and then review it with them and make sure that you've got that alignment. What that's gonna do is help you uh, in your future because every project has problems, and it's gonna help you with your leadership uh, to be able to uh, resolve those issues when they know what those objectives clearly are that are stated. And again, as I mentioned, uh, assure that your team members know what's expected of them, everything from their time commitment, what are their responsibilities and authority. Um, we'll talk more about milestones in a bit, but you wanna establish those early milestones. What are the step-by-step the -step, uh, activities that you will be doing? And Finally, it's really important that everyone, you, your team, your sponsors, and your stakeholders know that, okay, now that we've done all the planning, the project is underway. So by creating, by having an, an, a kickoff meeting, an official beginning, you're making that signal, and that's your first milestone. So make it official, make it a, make it a, a specific meeting, presentation, whatever it might be, that now everyone knows you're starting. Now that you're ready to start, all of your planning is done, your team is set, you've aligned with sponsors and stakeholders, I'm gonna come back to the definition that I shared in the beginning. The project manager is a leader of the team who will actually do the work. Now, what does that sound like to you if, if someone is leading a team? Well, in my first role as a project director, the first time leading a project, uh, I was leading a team and I hadn't met the team, I was, um, following a process that I wasn't familiar with, tools that I wasn't familiar with, technology I knew little about. The advice that was given to me by one of the mentors was just be the orchestra director. And it's not so different, as I note here. 
you know, if you take that analogy with an orchestra director, what do they do? They don't actually play the instruments. It's the orchestra that plays. They don't shine. They don't do solos in the performance. But every member of the orchestra has to have their eyes on the conductor. They must play from the same music to be successful. Although an orchestra conductor might have some ability to play an instrument, uh, and it's good that they do, they almost never can play all the instruments, certainly not uh, to the level of the members of the orchestra, the experts in the orchestra. And the, but they must know how each section works, how each instrument works. And like the orchestra conductor, the project leader must also understand the management processes, must understand um, the, the level of technical, have at least a, a minimal level of technical understanding in each area to be successful. And that means like me, uh, if they're not an engineer, like I am not, but we're leading engineers, we must understand something about engineering, understand something about the software technology. Um, and so this occurred to me in multiple times in projects. And the key there is acting as if you do understand it and learn and don't, don't worry about perhaps uh, making mistakes along the way because you will learn and you will grow and uh, your team will help you with that. Um, I'd like to have a to show a video here that talks about that shows a little bit about being a, a leader when you may not know exactly everything about what you're doing. So uh, Victoria, could you show the video, please? Do I need to stop sharing? There we go. Reactor three's at critical mass. Core temperature still rising. You're gonna have to provide more cooling in the containment chamber. Okay. Close the flow channels, activate the hydrogen recombiners. Do it. Well, actually, I'm with the tour group, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Stay smart. Stay at a Holiday Inn Express. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, here, let me get my uh, screen back up. Oops. <laughs> So I realize it's a, a little bit funny, uh, but the, the key here is that uh, you don't always know uh, every detail, but it's important to be a leader and uh, a little humor doesn't hurt either. Um, you know, it's important also, if you think about the orchestra director, they need to constantly communicate with each section, making sure they come in at the right time, cut off uh, at the right time. And this basically this knowledge gave me comfort that I didn't have to know everything, but the team relied on me for leadership and eventually I was able to be successful. So now a person can't lead if we're not followers. So as we've discussed and as we will continue to discuss, the leader must earn the right to lead. It's important for the project leader or the leader in any role really to understand the makeup of the team they are leading and what roles they are asked to take. And in projects, you likely have functional leaders on your team. These leaders can be referred to as subject manager, manager, excuse me, subject matter experts or SMEs, as they're often called. And they might be in a particular area of expertise or function, such as engineering or consumer services. Or they might have a more specific expertise, like someone in my case in project that I'm leading now, which is an expert in software development for voice control, integrating our appliances together with Amazon Alexa Voice. As a leader, you'll gain a much stronger team if you help your team recognize that they are able to contribute more than just their individual SME defined role. They're a member of the project team and therefore 
They're expected to support each other as team members, and you can encourage them to do that. Even though, as I mentioned earlier, stay in the lane, but it's also your role as the leader to be able to coach them to say, you know, step up and do other things if you have capability and if the team is aligned to it and you as a leader are aligned to it. Uh, going back to the uh, analogy of the orchestra director, you know, you might uh, need to have a bass guitarist who is going to be in a unique rock fusion composition, but that bass guitarist might come from your trombone section because that's what they play. So just keep that in mind. Find out the qualities of your team members. And that's a key thing. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Also, uh, be looking for potential leaders from your team and groom them. I'm currently mentoring a scrum master, for example, who's learning to be a project manager by letting him lead one of the projects that I would normally have led. This is giving him a lot of visibility to leadership and guidance and support while I coach him in the activity. As a leader, it's, it's important, as I mentioned, I talked about milestones. It's important your team knows that they are on track. How do they know that? Um, how do they know to continue in the right direction? And for this reason, uh, the leader can establish clear milestones to help the team assess together whether adjustments need to be made and even whether a redirection might be needed. Sponsors of the project will also want opportunities to either be able to know that it's on track or even make decisions. And that's something that you can align as a leader with your sponsors or your stakeholders. Um, milestones like markers on a highway let you know that you are where you want to be and help you change course at certain points along the way. Establish these markers when you do your planning and they will serve you well to assess your progress. These markers can also be an opportunity to celebrate accomplishments. And I encourage you as a leader to have uh, accomplishments that are small celebrations along the way. This is important for individual and team motivation. It's also helpful for your team to break down key tasks into more details. These work breakdown tasks are very much uh, kind of a skill around project management, but it can be done in any activity and work where you break down activities that can be done by individuals and reviewed with a leader for alignment or can be done by smaller groups, groups within the team and don't always have to be into the details uh, with the project leader as long as they know that work is being done. Um, remember the recent discussion of the orchestra director around that as well. I once had uh, one of my mentors would regularly not only check in with me, uh, but with other project managers that he was leading. And his first key question always when he was coming in to learn about a new project and assess whether the project was being uh, managed in, in a positive way, he would say, what is your management system? And this was his way of quickly determining whether the project was set up for success. At first glance, you might think that having a management system in place has nothing to do with leading people, but it does. When you're leading a project team, one of the first things you have to have in place before you start leading your team, and I realize this is leading the team, so hopefully you've done a little advanced planning around this, is having a strong management system. Think about these things that I'm going to list out here and make your decisions about how you will manage your project and your team as you start. And as you continue along the way, you can adjust as you go. So first of all, meetings. What types of meetings uh, do you have? When are they set up? What's the length of the meetings? How frequent do you have them and what are the purpose? You must have purpose to meetings or don't have them. Uh, also report outs, reports, reporting on the progress of the meeting of, of a project is something that a leader will always have to do. And it's important to have a plan on knowing how you're gonna report information from the team and within the team. Know who your audience will be and create that communication plan. Uh, you know, there are regular report outs by email or do you have meetings? How often do you do it? Every week, every other week, every month? Know what you're going to do and then be consistent about it so your leaders know what to expect. Uh, also, how much information should you put into those leadership reports? And you can get feedback from your, your sponsors uh, or people that you're reporting out to. It's also important to know how your team is going to communicate internally. What tools do you use? Do you use chat? Do you use uh, email? Um, 
it helps for the team to understand so they can work together and respond quickly. Uh, you also want to have tools for tracking. Uh, these are some of those project management tools that I mentioned before, but I tend to use, uh, and you can create this easily in a, in a spreadsheet format of uh, actions, risks, issues, decisions, and accomplishments. All the team uses this uh, collaborative document and everything is tracked in that one place where we close things out. And the way I lead projects is we don't end the project until everything has been addressed in that action register. Um, in decision-making, <clears throat> it's important to agree on how the team is gonna make decisions. <clears throat> is this a consensus team where you have to have a general agreement? Do the SMEs make the decision in their specific area? Do you vote? Or are some decisions made exclusively by the project leader? And finally, in your project management system, you need to take you need to take a, pay attention to documentation. Uh, it's important to have an established process and a location where project information is documented and saved for future reference. It's a lot easier these days. Everything can be electronic, but this will establish history for future projects and gives your team members evidence of accomplishments that they can use with their organizations or future business or future opportunities. Um, and uh, documentation helps to establish uh, all the history on that project itself. <clears throat> Stephen uh, H.R. M. R. Covey in his book, The Speed of Trust said, the first job of a leader at work or at home is to inspire trust. It's to bring out the best in people by entrusting them with meaningful stewardships and to create an environment in which high trust interaction inspires creativity and possibility. I believe there are three key ways you as a leader of a project team can establish that trust. First, as I've noted here, be a servant leader. Often servant leadership is misunderstood. Being a servant leader has demonstrated that it can result in positive business performance and outcomes. It's just not about being nice, but it's by demonstrating that you support an individual on your team by acknowledging their expertise and supporting them in a way that they need it, you are serving them and building up to be their best. Secondly, accept failure. Admit what you're wrong, when you're wrong and when the team has failed. Your team will respect you, will follow your lead. As the leader, you're establishing a culture, not a failure, but of learning. And failure is learning. I knew a former CEO that told me he thought he was going to get fired for an $8 million expense that he made a mistake on. And he was surprised that his boss said, why would I fire you? I just spent $8 million training you. So finally, perhaps most importantly, in order to build trust and get to know each of your team members as individuals, know what's important to them, know them on a personal level, understand who they are, and they will, um, they will uh, build that trust with you. But if you understand a little bit about their personal lives, you'll know what motivates them and you can help them along the way. And when you criticize, you can make it obvious that you care. They'll know you're, where you're coming from and they will accept that. Um, I'm going to uh, talk just a little bit about communication. I won't go into the detail here because I know our time is a little short, but I do wanna mention that communication in leading teams and being a leader is absolutely critical. Um, meetings can be necessary evil, but if you review these things like in your meetings, be very efficient, schedule your meetings, uh, publish an agenda. Uh, Stand-ups are 15-minute quick reviews, often daily, so that each team member knows what the others are doing and can support them if needed. Um, make sure you have a clear plan to report your progress, as I mentioned before. And it's important to regularly meet with your team members one-on-one -on -one so that you uh, can get to know things that you wouldn't know any other way. And I don't want to minimize either the team member supervisors to make sure that you've aligned on time commitments. And also, you may have an opportunity to provide feedback for their performance appraisals as well. Closing the project, I just want to state a few things that you make sure that you do have a clear project closure. Everything begins and everything ends. And so make sure that you've reviewed all of your, your objectives in the beginning. Meet, Declare the project complete. Meet with each team member individually uh, so they, they know as well whether there's any follow-up work that might be needed and also get alignment from their supervisor. And then 
don't forget to celebrate. When a project ends, it's you up to you as the leader to celebrate publicly. Thank each team member publicly. This is different than those ongoing uh, milestone celebrations. Many leadership books and theorists acknowledge that thanking people for their work can have more positive impact than financial compensation. And make sure that you reflect. There, organize a retrospective so you can allow each team member to contribute what went well, what should have been improved, what could have uh, been done differently or discontinued. Put that in a documentation and that a document and that goes into your documentation. And again, I mentioned, make sure you document everything so that it's set aside for you. I'm gonna close with five key ways to communicate value to your people because we're talking about leading people. Initially, make a decision that you will highly value your people. Once you make that decision here, it's gonna come out uh, clearly uh, in how you deal with your people. Communicate through as many ways as you can. Speak words of affirmation regularly uh, so they know that they are valued. Many people need that to hear that. Uh, be a student of your people. Know who they are and become committed to them and they will commit to you and you will be successful in your project. Thank you. I'm open for questions and hope I didn't uh, take too much time, Stefano. No, uh, thank you so much, John, for, for the clarity, for the kind of like, it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Thank you, thank you so much. I think um, everybody kind of benefited from your talk. Uh, I would like to start in some sense, the open, open the floor for questions. And uh, um, since I was the one introducing you, I introduced the question, so to break the ice, so then okay. the, other, the other people can actually follow along. Sure, and so, sure. so even because I teach some of the leadership classes, and I'm always interested in the kind of field experience and the people who did like <clears throat> lead large projects, as in your case, and so on. Um, maybe can you, would be interesting, like kind of, can you share a time when you mentor team members by getting to know them and it results in an expected positive outcomes, for example, some kind of like examples, like kind of, I think yeah. um, the, it's like the anecdote of the CEO um, saying, I just spent $8 million to train you. So why should I fire you? Actually, that's a kind of part of the best example of leadership you can get there. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think you have plenty of this in 40 years of experience, plenty of stories. I'm, I think students would kind of be interested. You know, um, I, have, I have several, but one that comes to mind specifically is, uh, and probably the, the most challenging, not only project, but role I had in my 35 plus years at Whirlpool was going to China and leading a project with a Chinese joint venture, 50-50, very challenging. Uh, the, the Chinese uh, partner didn't have the same objectives we did. And so it was a constant uh, challenge every day. And I'm putting that very lightly by calling it a challenge. Uh, and one of the things that we did is we brought in a, a cross-functional team, actually a a global team, and we brought them to China to lead the manufacturing operation. And uh, uh, one of the people that that sticks out in my mind very much is uh, the the leader of that team. And initially, they were reporting into the manufacturing group, and we discovered that that was just not working. Uh, and so I proposed that to have that person report to me, even though again I was sort of like the guy in the video. I had no idea about how to build a refrigerator, how to manufacture a refrigerator, but uh, I learned and I spent a lot of days, long days in the plant, learning each step. How do you do this? How do you do that? So I was able to gain the knowledge. And this young man who was leading uh, that manufacturing team um, <clears throat> was very challenged by being, you know, fighting with the partners every day. Uh, one of the things I discovered by getting to know him, though, was uh, we talked. We had many talks, and one of those talks was, "What do you want to do with your life?" And it, as it turned out, <laughs> he was a manufacturing guy all the way. But as it turned out, he started to show interest, or I would say, capability in project management. And he never thought about being a project manager. Mm -hmm. Eventually, when the project ended, and he went back uh, to the United, he was actually from Brazil. He went to the United States. Uh, long story short, is he became a project leader. And of leading very specific, very high, you know, big volume, large refrigeration projects in the U.S., but not as an engineer, as a project leader. 
And so what's the price, you know, it's kind of surprising to me is that, I mean, I discovered that I thought he would be great at it. I encouraged it, but it was all his decision. And I think all the tough times we went together kind of helped him, shaped him to, to do that work uh, for the future and help the company. I think you're going to get many, many questions here. I'm just a reading, so you can okay. actually at least I'll let you. From the, so how do you keep team members motivated best, especially now with remote work, John? Uh, very good. I have I have a number of teams that that are most many of them are based actually in India. We have software engineers in India today and in some uh, projects that I'm leading. And the, the way we I mean we have daily meetings, first of all. So we continue to, to check in with them. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, I think it's really important to have one on one meetings. So I meet with each of the team members, no matter what the level on a regular basis. It might be once a month but checking in with them and <clears throat> allowing them to share, you know, what's going on personally. We had, for example, had a, had a, uh, one of our key engineers, software engineers uh, sent a note to, to the team saying, I've got to be out for a couple of days, but over time we build the trust by me being vulnerable and saying, I have this issue. It allows them, as I said before, you're setting the tone uh, for what is allowed to share. Mm -hmm. So this young man shared that, well, my father was having some health issues. And so I had to be out for two weeks. This is not typical of people mm -hmm. in India. They're usually fairly yeah. guarded. Yeah. And so as, as we've opened that up with the team, you know, we feel more connected when people become more vulnerable. So the best way to do it is for me to be vulnerable myself. Uh, and that yeah. allows others to realize they can do the same. And that's building that trust and relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, also, Jeff uh, is asking, what is the number one quality according to you for a leader to possess or work on? So what do you think is the number one quality a leader should have? Wow, there's a, there's a number of qualities. I think, um, I think it's, it's a combination. So uh, there's, this is my personal belief. People don't, you know, there may be different views on leadership, mm -hmm. but my belief is that there needs to be a combination of confidence and strength and humility and the right balance between them. So being uh, decisive, uh, making difficult decisions, being important to do that is one, but not do, doing that without humility just makes into a tyrant or makes somebody who's just directing. And mm -hmm. the humility part is, you know, being accepting those mistakes um, and being willing to admit that with the team. Mm -hmm. I hope you have free afternoon, right? So you're in the US. So you have free afternoon, yes. John, because the. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> Well, no, I just like kind of I'm looking can, like I'm a bit scared of the number of questions. Anyway, so I'll try. OK, so I the, can go a little bit over, but yeah. OK, okay. sorry about it. <laughs> no, that's OK. I'm, I appreciate oh, it, that. It means you did a good job, by the way. So anyway, so what is the most common mistake that might happen in event management? Event management. So what do you think is the most common mistake there? In event management? Event management, yes. Uh, event management is not necessarily my expertise specifically, but uh, I think uh, this is anonymous preparation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 uh, not preparing for contingencies. So mm -hmm. it's really important to think through what are what things what are all the things that could go wrong, uh -huh. and planning around that. I spent several years doing. Uh, uh, working uh, the uh, CES booth for Whirlpool in yeah. in uh, Las Vegas, and you know everything that could go wrong went wrong at one time <laughs> or another. So it's really important that you can either do it with a team. You can sort of uh, you know have yeah. a brainstorming. What are all the things that could yeah. go bad? Okay, what are we going to do about it? That's risk management. Like, yeah, and one of the things that we that, that we've also done in project management is to create a risk register. Mm -hmm. And then actually list out what are the risks and project management teaches there are positive risks and negative risks. Yes. What are the good things, the unexpected things, and also the negative and, and dealing with the potential for all those is, is uh, really important, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any advice on building cohesion in a team and promote good supportive communication between team members from Miro? Uh, 
you know, I think uh, what's what it, it's important to to give opportunities for collaboration between the team members. So um, it's a little more difficult now in our virtual environment, uh, but give opportunities for people to work together, give them assignments to work together uh, so that, and, and then keep track of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, in, in my, this is more general, not just in leading projects, but in supervising people um, in, you can quickly recognize when you have personality clashes mm -hmm. and helping people through that. I mean, everyone does not work with everyone wonderfully. People clash. I've worked with people who clash. And what I discovered myself, and this is what I coach other people to do, is you can't change the other person, but you can change yourself and you can change how you react to that other person. So if you coach your team members as well in that same way, to not assume that I'm going to get this person to change, but how can I go from um, in a relatedness, not relationship, but relatedness, working together, maybe uh, categorize that one to 10, and maybe it's a two. How do I get it to a four? What can I do? And mm -hmm. that's, I know that's not a straight answer, but I think it's, it's a way to try to put a, a process together. And then mm -hmm. you as a leader, you, you need to recognize if you have team members that aren't working together to try to help them through that. Mm -hmm. And it's it can be very uncomfortable sometimes. A quick question from Dave about your experience in China. You are expert of China. So did culture impact your <laughs> interpersonal dynamics on the project? And if so, how did you approach these issues? Yeah, and when we speak of China, I mean, the most recent was mainland China, which is very different than Hong Kong, very different than Taiwan. Uh, and I'll speak in mainland China. Uh, let's see. Uh, what was the interaction question? I'm trying to see if I can uh, see Did culture impact culture. interpersonal? Yeah, how culture basically did impact interpersonal dynamics on the project? For sure. Um, it's such a huge question. We could we could do a whole, I mean, a, a, a semester class on. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, but I would say just at a high level, um, culture, the Chinese culture for sure is, uh, it is different in, in the, a big way in that um, you and I can have Stefano this relationship where we can talk and, and be very open about uh, answer questions straightforward. It's more of a Western approach, whereas a, the Chinese approach or even an Asian approach is going to be more guarded where what the interaction that you're having face-to-face -face is not the real yeah. interaction. There's, lots behind that and so you need to peel back that and understand um that it's just because someone said something doesn't mean that's actually what they meant and yeah. so that's it's the a, hardest it's thing. very it's very indirect right so it's kind of like yeah. and uh, um how normally you deal with this type of issues so, so um because yeah so kind of you need to understand the context in which it's being yeah. discussed maybe have other conversations to yeah. uh, understand it you know sometimes you have to break through that uh, in China, we just sometimes had to break through and ignore the culture because yeah. to get things done. So one of them was I had a I'll, I'll answer this very quickly, but I, I I needed to get something signed. There was a by the local Chinese joint venture to get some parts ordered or something like that. And and I was getting stonewalled a little bit. They weren't signing it. And so I'd, I had to go research. Well, who's the person who's the next person that has to put a stamp, a chop on it? You know, is going to go through their process. Mm -hmm. And I found that person and I was just getting so tired of the you know, stonewalling. So I went and, you know, the Chinese have a very open office. And mm -hmm. so I, I went into the room where that person was, there were probably 50 people in there. And I sat at the chair next to her desk. And I said to her in Mandarin, I'm going to sit here until you put the stamp on there. Mm -hmm. And I did. And it probably took yeah. an hour. I just sat there and she finally got tired of me and put mm -hmm. the stamp on. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes I that's think, what I'm saying. You have to break through. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Um, so what, what can you do, uh, again, anonymous, but what can you do if for whatever reason, maybe some team members are problematic, your team members do not follow your lead or do not respect that you are the mm -hmm. project manager? Yes. Well, 
That's when it requires a one-on-one meeting. I mean, you're going to know this. And so you need to talk (laughs) with them directly. And, you know, maybe, maybe there's something going on in their lives that you're not aware Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. that's affecting their behavior. But Mm -hmm. That's where you don't want to come in uh, very aggressively and say, you're not, you're not being part of the team, but come in in a more questioning answer. Here's what I'm seeing. Do you see the same thing? Mm -hmm. Uh, Is, and then try to find if there's something Uh else that's causing that. It's like a sort of reality check. It's like kind of like to see if we see the things in the same way. Yes. Um, Okay, that's an interesting question. You mentioned that you are now leading agile teams that uh, has been more difficult in any way. Has this been more difficult in any way? And how do you deal with simultaneously leading various teams using different approaches? How do you do that? Well, I'll answer the first question first, which is, um, and some of you may or may not be familiar with agile. It's a method of project management within software, especially uh, where there's not the, the, it's the difference between they call it waterfall and agile and waterfall was kind of where I learned project management where you're doing step by step. It's more for manufacturing and you have an end goal, you have a timeline, whereas agile, it's very loose. And what I found, at least at Whirlpool, is we're not we say we're agile, but we're not agile. So it's <laughs> finding this balance between our corporate leadership that says, you know, I want on this date, this timeline and true agile. You don't have an end date. Mm-hmm. Of course, you have two week sprints, and you're going to try to do what you need to do in the two weeks. And if you're not, you're measuring mm-hmm. it. So it can be very dangerous and agile to think that you don't have to meet objectives. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we try so, to ba- that's where we're trying to balance that. Um, that's actually very interesting. It seems like see, this is like when let's say manufacturing world meets like software industry. It seems to yes, be problematic, and that's, and that's right? Where, so that's exactly actually where we the are. clash. Like it's exactly one of the major issues there. Yes. So balancing the two actually is kind of interesting. So and how do you deal with simultaneously leading various teams? Using different approaches because yeah, you can like, use different approaches, but you know, I mean leadership. Uh, you can have the basic principles that are the same, yeah. but you know the team is is different. They so you tend to adapt basically. Oh sure, uh, you you tend to adapt to them. Okay, in your opinion, which is more important to project manager, technical or behavioral competencies? As them, is asking. <laughs> Okay. You, I, are you more like a, a sort of psychologist or like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm That's joking. Funny. No, no, but it's think... actually true, actually. Behavioral yeah. competencies or like technical competencies? How well, do you see yourself? Uh <sighs> I think it's more behavioral, to be honest, because mm-hmm. that's what's going to motivate people. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And they have to, you know, you need your technical experts. And for you to get credibility from your technical experts, you need to at least know a little bit. Mm-hmm. One of the things one of my one of my corporate leaders said to me years ago that stuck with me is that your people know what's important to them, what's important to you by the questions you ask. Mm-hmm. If you ask yeah. about things, that's what they know they need to work on or they need to pay yeah. attention to. And so that's a bit of the behavior of the psychology. Mm-hmm. But you don't know what questions to ask if you don't have a technical, at least a minimal technical. So you can come in and be totally not knowledgeable. Um, and that's one of the things that I've learned over my career is it's important to reinvent yourself and learn. And uh-huh. so I've gone into many roles where I knew nothing about that area of expertise. And mm-hmm. so anybody can do that. You just need to be willing to learn. Uh, uh, Tiago asked three questions. Sorry, Tiago. Um, <laughs> okay. It's one of my students. Actually, I'm going to actually pick one. Actually, actually, very interesting, this one. Actually, suppose the project has gone off the, tra- off the rails. So what steps would you take to get it back on track? What, what did you do in the past, in your experience? So if something happened like this, it can happen. I mean, right? Kind of like... It for, does happen. It does happen. Um, yeah. And... So. Um, off the rails means it's really just, you're going nowhere. So, um, <laughs> usually you need some intervention then yeah. probably. Uh, and so, um, I'm thinking of several things. One is I think if you realize that it is, it is really not going, you need to bring in help. You need to bring in intervention. So mm-hmm. whether it means you need to find out what that is. And so it probably means bringing the team back together and saying, admitting, look, we're, we're not, it's not going how mm-hmm. we expect. Where's the help that we need? And then so Mm. that's where an intervention, you might need a a leader to come in, but understand where the gaps are. Um, We might need to reassess the objectives. And that means going to leadership and saying we're off the rails. We need time here to reassess and we'll come back to you. You can't come Mm. and say this is not working, 
but you need to come back with, you can even get some, usually some, for, not forgiveness, but the get some time by saying, we need to, we need to put a halt and we need to assess and we need this amount of time. And then you need to go take that and kind of reassess and then come back and say, mm-hmm. here's our revised proposal. And you might mm-hmm. need to ask for resources to do that. Mm-hmm. Extra resources normally. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it seems it's a lot of people dealing with issues in teams here. How do you deal with people overstepping the responsibility or challenging authority and leadership? Well, did you have that? I haven't had a ton of experience in that, but what I think of is it goes back to my meeting individually. You know, it's not good to call somebody out, you know, in a, mm-hmm. in a meeting. I'm, I'm assuming these are things that happen um, without you being there and they just people are starting to do things. And um, so I just think it means meeting with those individuals and try to understand it. And in some cases, you may have to remove somebody from your team. And mm-hmm. ultimately, you can't be assume that that you know if someone is being that to that level that's not willing to change um mm-hmm. you need to have that conversation and then eventually you may have to mm-hmm. let the person move on um um uh, let me pick because here there are too many how to create mutual respect among olders and perhaps more experienced team members if you are a younger leader project manager so How to you gain lead, respect. yeah, probably it's like the situation like you are a young leader and you are more experienced team members or like older team members. Did this happen to you? Yes. So you mentioned before in your oh, career, sure. as well, you were leading all kind of older kind of team members, right? So Well, I have, but I mean, either older or perhaps maybe the to say more experienced. Um, you know, it's not about age necessarily or even about experience. If you um you can rely on those people as experts. And I would say, go to them and say, uh, I really need you in this area and I'm going to rely on you. Um, mm-hmm. If if they're overstepping, that's a different thing. But I mean, I, I don't see that as a problem at all. In fact, I would welcome uh, mm-hmm. as a young project leader where you're put into a role, I would really love to have experts who've been around a long time and, as, as long as they know that you respect them and their knowledge, uh, they're going to get behind you. So right. you just need to let them know that. And that's goes back to meeting with each, you know, with individuals um, mm-hmm. to let them know that. And uh, anyway. Um, oh, that's good. How do you stay motivated? That's an interesting question. Actually, how do you stay motivated and motivate others? If your vision and beliefs differ from that of the company, did happen to you in Whirlpool? Stay motivated. And motivate uh, others. If your vision at some point in some sense of belief starts to defer, you know, like you hear often this in the kind of management literature, like leaders and so on, you know, this company used to kind of, I used to kind of buy into those values. Now it's changed. Okay because of whatever reason you know like the stock market the usual stuff and so on. but now our values are changed and so on so uh, how do you keep uh, you stay motivated actually if you you kind of and keep motivating others you know like if you if you see a misalignment between what were the you know values uh, i can say that uh <clears throat> At least once, maybe more than once in my career, I've had a, I actually had a supervisor who uh, I respected, but later when I discovered things about the values of that person, uh, and it came down to, um, was not so much company values, but more people values. Mm -hmm. Um, We're not meeting up with my own, like this wasn't the person I thought they were. Um, You know, I honestly had a hard time working for that person and knew it was probably time to move to a different role. And so uh-huh. that's what I did. Uh, I, w- I was given the opportunity, so it wasn't really that difficult for me. But what I would give advice to is, is that, you know, if you can't respect <clears throat> the leader that you're working for yeah. or the organization that you're working for, then you probably shouldn't stay there is what I would say, because mm-hmm. that's not a good fit and and it will be demotivating. Mm-hmm. I um, I've been fortunate to, to be working for a company 
uh, with Whirlpool that's had excellent values. Mm-hmm. It's more of, yeah. you know, do the leaders I work with have those same values yeah. that the company has stated? Sometimes they don't always match up. And that's kind of a, a lucky marriage. So it's kind of like, yeah. it's luck. So you talk about, Joel is asking, you talk about tools for tracking who makes and contributes to yep. and moderates action, risks, issues, decision accomplishments. Yeah. Who makes so, and contributes to? There are there are companies that actually make uh, project management systems that that you can buy. But frankly, um, we use Google at Whirlpool, and so I've created my own uh, action register that you can do on easily on a spreadsheet, and it's quite simple to do uh, with the, the technology that we have, where you would you can do drop down menu where you have um, uh, basically create your columns of action. You know what type of issue is? It? Is it an action that has to be done? Is it an issue? Is it a decision that has to be made? So you you give a, a choice there. Then you might then you have other mm-hmm. columns that sort of define it, such as what is the issue. I even include an item number so that you mm-hmm. can refer back yeah. to it. And then you have a you have the issue. What is the issue? Very like just a few words. What it is, mm-hmm. and then we actually then put tracking in. So who's accountable for it? Uh, when was it? When was this issue initiated? So yeah. you can say, "Hey, this is like two months old. We got to deal with it." Mm-hmm. And then you would have um, basically by date. So we have meeting dates, and then each date I go through and I I update each one. Like, where are we? Who's who's accountable? What are we doing? And so we can keep track of them over time. This can just be create your own format in a Google Sheet uh, mm-hmm. quite easily and simply. And then when it's mm-hmm. completed, you can have a column for the status. You know. Is it, uh, did it just open? Is it in process? Is it <coughs> um, on hold or is it completed? Mm-hmm. And so you just create that spreadsheet. Uh, what normally did you take into consideration to set a milestone? These are key points in a project. They're not difficult to see, but usually it's maybe a decision point. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might be a financial point where you say, you know, um, this is a natural place where we're going to decide whether we keep going because the investment yeah. is so high. Um, it might be, um, a, let's say you, you can divide it up into portions. Like if you have a particular project that says um, this is a cur- certain component and we finish that component, that's a milestone. So yeah. it, every project is so different, but you try to find those natural points of transition. Um, not too long either. You don't want to mm-hmm. make them yeah. you know, six months. Uh, it might be weeks or or just a couple of months, but yeah. uh, I hope that helps. Um, just a few more. Sorry about that. So okay. just like they kind of keep coming. So <laughs> thank you for the amazing talk. I have two questions. First, how difficult it was to mitigate cultural and language barrier while working in Asia? And second, is it fair to consider your approach to management and leading as employee empowerment and individual development? Thank you again. Okay, so the first one was around. Yeah. Um, well, basically, mitigate mitigate, the, mitigate yeah. cultural and language barrier while working in Asia, which are normally kind of tall barriers because of they this are cultural distance. Yeah, um, I think you know, as in many countries, if you're able to learn a little bit about the culture first, it's really important. Yeah. Even uh, a basic understanding. So take some time to invest in that, so you yeah. do understand where they're coming from. You don't have to turn yourself into that culture, but you need to understand where they're coming from to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it also helps to, um, I mean, the best thing you can do is learn the language, but uh, that's a a tall ask, especially if you're um, there temporarily. So, you know, in in deference to that, learning a few words, the basic things and attempting to do it goes a long way toward Mm -hmm. the the people from that culture accepting. Yeah. And is it fair to consider you your approach to management leading as employee empowerment and individual development? Do you do that? Do you empower your kind of? Oh, absolutely. Employees? Yeah, I, I think empowerment is really important. Um, you know, you have to manage it to a certain degree. And individual development, of course, like. And definitely, I mean, that's one of the joys that I have of when I've supervised people, and that's why I enjoy teaching too, is empowering mm-hmm. people and letting them learn and grow and seeing seeing them grow and develop and um that that to me is almost uh more valuable than you know achieving a 
milestone in a project or something like that is seeing the people develop. Uh, as a project manager, how do you deal with fighting, infighting between team members, for example, rivalry between specific teams, departments, and so on? Do you have that? You know, a little bit. And I think you have to, as a project manager, you have to accept some conflict. <laughs> you have to be willing to kind of let things play out to some degree. Now, you have to know when to step in, but you can't be afraid of conflict. You have to kind of let it happen, to, you know, but in a, in a respectful way. Yeah. So that's the key. If it gets disrespectful, you shut it down. But I think, you know, sometimes it's a little uncomfortable where you have, you know, you don't want to step in and try to stop an argument because maybe that's how we're going to get to be the best we are mm -hmm. um, to let that play out. Is brainstorming better to do with large or small groups? Is is there any advantage or disadvantage with the one you experience? Well, you know, yeah. brainstorming. Um, there's a, there's many different methods to yeah. idea generation and yeah, brainstorming. It's a question so, from a student, but yeah, but uh, but <laughs> I think it, yeah, it's probably smaller is better. Uh, you're going to get more people are more willing to share. In larger yeah. groups, you can do it, but then what you want to do is break down into small groups and then bring them back together mm -hmm. and you'll get those ideas generated. So, you know, if you have a larger room of people, you want to have breakouts, you know, and have them each work on mm -hmm. things and then, and then report back. And that way you can get all, the key thing is getting everyone to have their ideas uh, shared. How can one have good communication with stakeholders when progressing with the project despite any language culture barriers? So how do you deal with stakeholders communication? So. I mean, they are quite important, right? So, I mean, like, yeah, especially nowadays, I mean, so. I mean, generally, uh, you know, as as difficult as it is, English is generally the the yeah. language of business globally uh, in most cases. And so, usually, if you're working in a global organization and you have mm -hmm. go across language barriers, um, if you're not a native speaker of English, it's a challenge. And so you mm -hmm. have to develop enough of a skill to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's getting, um, unfortunately that, you know, with stakeholders, uh, that's about the only way you're going to do it is what's the, what's the culture and generally what mm -hmm. I've seen in global businesses um, mm -hmm. that it, it happens in the English language mm -hmm. primarily. Uh Quite often, uh, Dave, uh, quite often projects have their goalposts moved, uh, sometimes quite often. How do you deal with such changes with the team members, especially if work has been wasted? Yeah, um, you know, uh, projects are going to have issues. And you're <laughs> right, the goalposts often move, but not because you want them to. Um, sometimes, you know, they you have a scope change. I just had a project that I've worked on for 15 months. And the problem is nobody liked the project either. <laughs> but we were going to do it. You know, I said, we're going to do this thing. And it just got uh, put on hold because the scope changed. I said, nope. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other things have changed, environment changed. So now we're going to do it differently. And we still don't know what it's going to look like. So, uh, sorry, we, so the, the way you deal with it is, is, um, we need, just need to be practical and assess, okay, uh, the scope has changed or something has changed. What is, how do we deal with it? Mm -hmm. So to be more practical rather than emotional about it, I guess. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you, so your job essentially as a leader, like, I mean, in terms of leadership, what do you do? I mean, you interpret your job as the one who is trying to explain to the others why we change and the scope has changed or give a reason for it. That's why That's, you invest most of your time, like kind of giving an understanding so in terms of in terms of leadership so you think that would or does help actually because indeed it's a wasted word it depends it i mean depends. right even if somebody else says it's going to change and if mm -hmm. it is important to make sure everyone is on the same page yeah what happened why is it changing it's definitely yeah. a big part of yeah. the leadership but yeah. it's also the other way is that someone comes in and change it's up to the project leader to make sure everyone knows the impact of that mm -hmm. what is the result of that yeah so a couple of very quick ones, so then I let you go. It's a kind of okay. like, it's been quite long. So how do you find or assess the right person for your team? How do you, what, what's in your mind when you select? So like kind of as a... 
mm-hmm. not in the end work, but your experience. I want to know from your experience, like, yeah. So what do you look for? I mean, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm coming to sit in your office and I applied for a job and I said, John, I want to work here and so on. So what, what do you would look for? Well, I'm going to probably um, the, know that at least you have a baseline of the whatever the technical issue yeah. is, you know, because otherwise then it's not really going to work. Yeah. So I would know that ahead of time, ideally from a resume or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but then I'm going to assess... Um, I'm going to assess teamwork, collaboration, a lot of that yeah. um, in the discussions that we have to try to make sure that, uh, you know, we can't, we don't accomplish things today by ourselves. No. And so if the person can't work and hasn't experienced or hasn't um, shown either through the interview or through their experience mm. that they've succeeded working together with other people and collaborated with other people, and I'm not sure what it is, how that could work together. Um, <laughs> But I think also just um, understanding their motivation. Are they motivated for success? Um, you know, are they self-motivated and just everyone yeah. get out of the way? What, where, what's their basis of, of working? Uh, what motivates them? And if, if they are driven towards success, uh, that's great. Um, so it's a combination of things. That's, yeah, sorry, just a couple of I more raising more. hands. Sorry about that. It's just like, I mean, <laughs> I, you know what? I'm going to invite you again so we have it like we can split it even, <laughs> you know, over the summer. Okay. You can come like, an, okay, so when looking for new project members or new employees, what gets a CV resume to the top of the pile for you? These are good for students because they are yeah, at the beginning sure. of their career. So like, and I, in some sense, actually kind of, it ties up with one of the things I want to ask you, if you have a piece of advice for our student, like in your kind of very long experience, like a piece of advice for our students, uh, they are starting their career and so on. So how should they kind of write a CV for John? So, <laughs> Well, I like to see uh, a lot of action. I like to see um, it's, it's important to have experience and it doesn't matter if it's uh, work experience in the industry, or if it's other type of work experience, if it's volunteer experience, but I like to see what have, what do you articulate as the accomplishments that you've yeah. done, um, and in a more action-based kind of way. I will say I'm very particular, not maybe not everybody is, but about the detail. So I, I don't want to see any, any mistakes, not one, you know, spelling, okay. Um, layout. We because say that, that all the time. <laughs> we do, and and it's really hard because you do it yourself, yeah. and we we it's hard to avoid mistakes. Mm. But um, that to me is an attention to detail. It says about the person as well, and so you can ask, you can get a lot of help from people to make sure your resume is free. But that's not the only thing. I mean, mm-hmm. um, it's the attention to detail to is, but it's not about the volume either. It's about the quality yeah, yeah. of what's there. So talking about, you know, how a person articulates the achievements, right? So how they see yeah. that, like kind of, okay. Uh, that's very interesting. So I think there was Jennifer with one more question, but I can't find a question. She raised the hands. Uh, She's hiding. Under the straw. No, no. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. So, Jennifer, yeah. Do you, Jennifer, do you want to ask a question? No, oh, no, sorry. No? Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Nope. So she she doesn't want to she doesn't want to ask a question. So, well, what can I say? I mean, um, it was brilliant. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, I, I think you it. you basically definitely broke any records of questions given to a master speaker so it makes you eligible for another one automatically okay. so, so we will talk <laughs> okay. about that the price so. <laughs> sure well thank you i i do appreciate very much this no. is very enjoyable and and i love doing this kind of thing so thank you for the invite and, and the no, long th- thank you so much for taking your time i know kind you're of welcome you're busy and so on so we'll talk about <laughs> the next appointment but no okay. thank you thank you really so much i think for um, for our students was kind of like uh, an amazing experience and your talk was absolutely brilliant. Um, very clear, kind of neat and kind of amazing. Good. So um, absolutely happy and thank you again. So it's been a great pleasure to have you here. 
So looking forward to have you again, John, and thank you for accepting the invitation on behalf of the college and the School of Business. Thank you. My pleasure as well. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good evening. Well, good afternoon for you. I will. You have a good evening. Thank you. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Thank you.